Greg's gonna make sure he's got that big deep voice that he has. Yeah, I, I'm pretty loud. If you all can't hear me, just raise your, yes, sir. Can I ask a quick question just before we get started? Folks, any question you all have during my talk, please hold up a hand. Don't, don't sit there with a the question, please. Bring your hands up right in the middle of the talk. I encourage that. Well, I yes, sir. I don't know if we have dung beetles here, but maybe we do. We do. Okay. Yep. Well, yep, you do. We don't have, uh, we have very few rollers because we're so far north. Yep. Southern Alberta, Southern Saskatchewan, Southern Ontario will have a few rollers. Yep. Uh, we most, mostly have dwellers and, and some tunnelers. Yep. Okay, so we use Ivamec. and yep. I would love not to use Ivamec. So yep. what do you do instead? Just, okay, so the question is, you use an Ivamec and he doesn't really want it, what do you use instead? So let me give you an example. The, the farm we were on at Dawson Creek on uh, Thursday, uh, he stopped using Ivamec two years ago. And he was conventional and he did it more uh, spring and fall. And um, Ian always has always said, if you're gonna stop Ivamec, uh, you know, he calls it kicking the stool out from underneath, or the crutches out from underneath your cow. Well, let them build up immunity, but do it slowly to keep from having a wreck of having to call too many cows that can't take it. So if you're doing it twice a year, figure out which one you want to kick out. Either the spring I have a mech or the fall I have a mech. And do it. Then the next year, kick the crutch completely out. That's what this guy did in uh, Dawson Creek. And um, folks, it was one of the prettiest cow herds I've ever been in, including in the United States. And I've been in some pretty, cute, I've been in some pretty nice herds. That guy, those cows were slick. There wasn't a dirty tail on any of them. And he hasn't used Ivamec now. I think he's going on three years. His manure pats were full of dwellers. You could open it up and they'd come to the surface and then all these little bike beetles just flying around. They're flying out too, they fly. And so I would recommend cutting out one and the next year completely go cold turkey. Okay, and yeah. just one more part to that. So you say you don't have a fly problem no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I have a reduced fly problem. I'm glad, this is good, folks. So uh, you're getting into my talk, too, a little bit. You're stealing my thunder here, OK? Um, yeah, we, we do still have flies. But uh, one of the things that helps with flies is moving. Do you all know that when a fly hatches out of a manure pile, he doesn't travel much more than 100 yards from his manure pad? So what happens when you're moving your cows? You're out running the flies. A lot of them. You're still going to have some flies. The lowest volume of flies we have on our cow herd is right after a mob move. We've moved them from one end of the farm maybe to the other. We've started a, prog a program now where we skip graze. So let's just say we come onto a 200 acre farm and we're going to the end of it. We'll graze a section, we'll skip a section, we'll graze a section. So we're leaving a blank area that's not grazed in between our rotation. And then we get to the end, guess what? We've got something to graze on the return trip. With baby calves, that's a big deal. Because you're not having to make a cattle drive the full length of your farm with a bunch of babies. You're only having to get to the next paddy. But skip grazing, leaving a section between that manure and your next paddy, it leaves a lot of the flies behind. And if you don't believe me, go back to that paddock that you just took the cows out of the day before. There's flies all over it. There's, but they're not on your cows, because your cows are up here. Learn to pick out cows that have slick hair coats. We're going to talk about that. I got some pictures here. Any other questions before we get going? Just one on your keeping your uh, calves on your cows long. You're saying you're with the same herd. Do you have any trouble with them trying to suck? Yeah, so the question is leaving the cows and the calves together, making the cow wean the calf. Is there a problem with that? The calf sucking when the new calf is born. Yeah. yeah. Um, occasionally you'll have a cow that does that. She, won't, she will not wean her calf. And if she gets thin and she raises me a dink, a new one, it's a dink because he didn't get enough milk, gone. Yeah. You get rid of them. Folks, I'm the predator in my herd. I keep a little tablet. It's about this size. And every day I walk into my herd, I'm like, which one of you girls want to leave the farm? <laughs> No, I do. I'm serious. I'm writing it down. I'm writing the number down. I'm writing the number down because you'll never have a cow herd any better than what you call for. 
If you set your bar really low, oh, Priscilla, I love you, but you didn't give me a calf this spring. I'll give you a chance. You can breed back for fall. We'll get a calf this fall. Out. Oh, Priscilla, you didn't have one. Well, I'll try you next spring. You can't do that. If the cow doesn't have a calf, it's got to be gone. Same way on sheep. If that ewe doesn't breed, get rid of her. Don't name your animals. <laughs> okay. I love the question. Yes, ma'am. Don't make it a final question. Keep the questions coming. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the silver pasture, the steps you talked about, can you do that successfully without the pig part? Without the hay part. So the question is... Without the pig part. The pig. Oh, without the pig. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the pigs, uh, they just like to root, and they'll, they'll root up a lot of the roots, and uh, they will push it along a little faster, but we don't have pigs anymore. We're just doing it with cattle, absolutely. We just cleared an area the uh, winter before last. I mean, we took a lot of trees out of this area. Then we brought hay and unrolled it. This spring, it's got green in it already. In one year. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have a question. When you were talking about uh, pastures getting away from you and your... Yes. Your yes. Um, on my pasture, I all of a sudden, I found that uh, they were, it's in the lower land a little bit. And so then... Uh, it was getting really rough, so I rolled it with a big, heavy roller. Yep. And I was really shocked at uh, the new regrowth I got. And yep. It was then when the cows come back, they just loved it. Well, did y'all hear his his comment? He said that the grass in his lowland gets uh, a little bit mature and rank, and he went in and he rolled it, and what came back was pretty darn good stuff. A lot of new plants. Uh, I have a neighbor did the exact same thing. He has a roller. And he rolls, he rolls his whole farm in the spring behind the cows. So whatever the cows don't graze, he's got one of these rollers like you use on cover crops. It's got the water in it. Have you all seen those? He rolls his whole farm. And he's, he swears by it. Uh, that's a lot of diesel fuel because he's got a big farm. But he's, he's retired. He enjoys rolling it. So, and he thinks it does him some good. Um, so, yeah. Any way to get that carbon on the ground and then get new plants coming up is probably a plus. Yeah. All right. Um, whoa. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I did. <laughs> You're awesome, by the way. You're saving me a lot of walking. So animal performance. Let's go back one right there. So the sun travels in straight lines. It comes down. And uh, so your top leaves, if you watch animals and you turn them into a paddock, they'll take the top part of your paddock off. That's where the energy, you're going to hear me talk about energy. There's energy and there's protein. They're getting a lot more energy when they graze the tips of the plants. Higher gains. Energy is carbohydrates, sugar, fats. Think about that. Okay. So if you leave them an extra day, which is what I've done, your forage nutrition goes down, and if you lose animal performance, you will go broke. Folks, what's the highest cost of product? What's the highest in what's the highest cost of a cow calf operation? Feed. Somebody said feed. That's the second highest cost. What's the highest cost? Animals. What'd you say? Animals. Animals. Uh, an open animal. An open cow. Folks, I can buy a bred cow in April in Missouri right now for about $1,700. She's a good one, three to five year old. I take her through the summer, she has her calf, I take the calf off in the fall, and I didn't give her enough to eat. She didn't breed. Now I've gotta take that open cow back to the sale barn, guess what I get for her? Seven, eight hundred dollars. I lost a thousand dollars on one cow. That's how you go broke. That's how you can go broke in the cattle business. So be careful. They've got to have enough to eat. If you lose animal performance, you will go broke. That's a spring picture. So we're looking for plants that are recovered before we graze them. I don't want to start grazing a little short plant because it's going to hurt it. We call that lopping the baby's head off. So you got a baby grass coming up in the spring, you get out there too soon and you nail that thing, well now you're not going to get any regrowth for your second grazing. It's just not going to come back very well. We call that grazing the roots off your farm. Think about that. You've just grazed the roots off your whole farm. 
because you took more than 50% of the plant. We like to graze the top third, and we don't get it perfectly. They're going to graze half, some a little bit lower, but try and keep your grazing up in the top canopy. So back to your question on worming, where's the parasites live? They live on the ground, on the lower portion of your forage. So if you're always grazing up here, the cows are not ingesting the parasites. Your parasites are down on the ground. Why are they down there? They're trying to escape sunlight. Sun is enemies to parasites. Graze high, no more Ivamec. They don't get wormy. Move them. You're a lot more drought hardy. You got a better plant out there to block the sun. You know, uh, the taller the plant, the more dew you collect, and it acts as a wind. Wind, you don't, you cannot imagine how much moisture wind takes off your farm. But if you've got a canopy out there, think of it as all these little wind breaks. It slows the wind down. You're not going to lose as much moisture. So there's a plant on the top that's not ready to graze. I've already grazed it in April. Uh, this would be May 1st. It's grown back. Now it's got a point on it. I'm ready to hit it. So focus on energy. Energy is also the costliest item to buy. Plant tips, that's what we focus on. We're seeing increased daily gains now by grazing up here in the top part. The plants are growing back quicker. That farm we were on at Dawson Creek the other day, he went in there in, um, well, you're, let's see, it was 1st of May. It's 1st of May. And he, what we call flash grazed a big field. There's like 80 acres. He took 170 cows through there. He flash grazed it. He just put them across real quick. And we were on that as a recovered paddock. That was the last stop we made. Folks, that paddock had completely regrown. It had completely regrown. It had a lot of legumes in it. It was palatable, but he set it back enough that it didn't get mature on him before he got around his first rotation. So that's where he was going to move the cows to when we left. And that was some high quality feed he had there. Quicker, cooler soil, you got cooler soil, just keeping the sun off of it. Talked about the parasites. We have a fescue in Missouri, it's called Kentucky 31. You all don't have that up here. I think you all have a red, what they call red creeping fescue or meadow fescue or something. The Kentucky 31's a beast. It'll kill your cows, some cows. It restricts the blood flow to the extremities of the animal. And uh, so you all don't have to deal with that. Of course, there's a lot more drought proof. Um, we like to feel like we're feeding the soil with the roots. So when you graze off the top, you're getting some root exudates sloughing off the root themselves. The litter, getting the litter on the ground. And of course, manure and urine. Folks, with set stocking where you're not rotating your animals, it takes 27 years to cover your farm with a manure pile every square yard. With mob grazing where you're, you, you're bunching them up, say 40 to 60,000 pounds per acre, you can cover every square yard of your farm in three years. What's so important about that? Well, those manure paths are worth a dollar a bill a piece. Think about that. You don't want them spread everywhere. Well, you you got to look to find one. You should have them density, and that's what increasing your stock in density and moving your animals a little bit. I hate that picture. I hate this because that's my farm and those are my cattle, not the black ones. Those are custom grazed. Look at that. How stupid was I? That's called the death triangle. I named it that years ago. People look at that picture and they see that forage and like, well, Greg, looks like they got plenty of grass. No, you didn't see the picture before. They took it down way too short. Folks, when you got animals like that, you're pushing them too hard. They should have been moved sooner, okay? Or you should have gave them a bigger area. Because this cow is not going to breed back. Once the, pH of the, once the pH in their gut goes to 9, it goes past 8 and hits 9, they don't even cycle. They won't even cycle to get bread because you didn't give them enough energy. Protein is not an issue. You always can get protein. But it's the energy. That's the one that makes them fat. Okay? I don't like that picture. 
So how do you know if you've got a death triangle on a cow when you go to look at them? It's always if you're sitting on the cow and you're riding it. It's the left side. Don't look on the right side. It doesn't tell you anything. It's the left side of the cow if you're riding it. Okay? Folks, that's not my cow. I want to make that clarification. That's not my cow. This is a lady in South Carolina. She was doing grass-fed beef. She had me come out to her farm. So I told her, I said, you could probably stand to give that cow a few more groceries. And she goes, well, that cow's actually picked up a lot of weight since winter. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Folks, that cow is a body condition score of one. She's almost ready to do that, fall over. Don't ever let your cows get that bad of shape. She was an idiot. She shouldn't have had any animals. She had 80 acres, I'm sorry, 80 cows on 800 acres. One paddy. So when the grass tried to stick its little head up, it got nipped off. She didn't have any grass. You know what else I hate about that picture? Look at this area right here, folks. The bottom of that belly to the ground. I can read a newspaper under that cow. If I open it up and stick it under her belly, I can read it. Do you know that area between the belly and the ground sells for nothing? It's just space. The more space under the belly of a cow, the higher maintenance it is. That cow's going to cost you a ton of money to keep her on your farm. Get rid of those. You don't want all that leg on a cow. Absolutely not. That's a great way to go broke. On a 100% forage system. Now, if you've got tons of grain, you can feed that cow. She'll get fat. That's going to cost you. It's going to cost you grain to do it. You can't do it with grass. Not and raise a calf. Go to the next picture. There you go. That's just right. So this is an all-custom graze herd that, that we call those are salt and pepper. There was Charlotte and Black both in there. And uh, on a hot summer day, people would come by our farms. That's a nice-looking Charlotte herd you got out there. I'm like, oh, no, there's some black ones out there, too. No, there isn't. There wasn't a single black cow out grazing at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Not one. They're all under the trees. And uh, they did a, a surface thermometer on a black-hided one and a, and a red-hided animal in Gillette, Wyoming. The ambient temperature that day was 105. The red-hided animal was 108. The black-hided animal was 138. Yeah, that's a big difference. Do you think that black-hided animal is going to put on weight when she's 138 degrees? Nope. Nope. That's why we run red cattle. In Missouri, it does get hot. Uh, black for wintertime? What's that? <laughs> yeah, you can switch to black for wintertime, absolutely. If you're custom grazing, get red in the summer and black in the winter. Yeah. Okay, rotations. This is a tough one, folks. We did a grazing school, and there was a guy who came from Texas every year for seven years. Every year he was there. Finally, Ian walked up to him and said, Robert, I noticed you're here again this year. He said, Greg, and I, are we just not explaining things good to you or what? Seven years in a row, he came. And he looked right at Ian and he said, Ian, he said, I'm just afraid to start. I'm just afraid I'm going to make a mistake. And he told him, he said, Robert, you've got to start and you've got to make mistakes. Ian still makes mistakes. I still make mistakes. Mistakes are nothing. It's just experience. That's all it is. But until you start, you've got to start. And I challenged people in South Dakota. I did a school at Rapid City, South Dakota. They were in a drought, 8,000 acre ranch, big ranches, ponds everywhere. The cattle were, there are 25, 30, over here there's 100. They were spread everywhere. They had no grass. It was a big, it was a big group. There was probably 700 ranchers at that talk. And I told them, I said, look, just go home and put up one wire. And they all looked at me like, just put up one wire. One, right down the middle of your ranch. I said, you'll grow twice as much grass. Some of them did it. Some of them didn't. The ones that did emailed me back that fall and said, Greg, you saved our ranch. They got some rain. They weren't grazing on this part of the ranch, and it, it took off growing. The ones that didn't, they didn't have any grass. It works. Rest is one of your tools in your toolbox. You've got to monitor what's out there. 
We monitor the rainfall. I, I write down every tenth of an inch I get. Folks, we didn't get any rain in March and April this year. None. Well, we got three tenths. Let me back up. We got three tenths. We hit 90 to 95 degrees F in April. We started, the, the, there just wasn't any regrowth coming back after we grazed it. And I was leaving it tall, but it wasn't coming back. And I'm like, well, I'm in trouble. I sold, all, I sold all of our steers. I was going to use those steers to put weight on to take up some of this grass that we normally have in the spring. We didn't have the grass, so I sold my steers. That's the number one animal in a drought you should sell. Number one. So for droughts, when you get in a drought, combine your herds. If you got three or four herds out there, why you got, why are you doing that? You got three or four herds grazing around your farm at the same time. You're killing your recovery period. You're not going to have enough time for those plants to grow back. Okay? Time. It's not the number of animals, it's how long they were there. So I sold all the steers. When they drove off in that semi, I was a happy camper. We sold early, we got our super high price for them, and they were gone. It took all the pressure off our farm. So what I was trying to do as a cow-calf man, folks, we've been building our herd since 2001. I don't want to be forced to sell out. It's going to take me a long time to build those genetics back. So I preserved my core cow herd in my bowls, and I got rid of the steers. Now, if it hadn't rained, it did. We finally got a rain like two weeks later. And people were laughing, ha, <laughs> it rained. What are you going to do now? I'm like, I got a lot of grass. There's nothing wrong with having a little extra grass. Bud Williams, an old guy that worked up here in Alberta, at a feedlot. Bud was a guy that was unbelievable smart. And he said, there's three things in the cattle business. You can run out of money. You can run out of cattle. But if you run out of grass, you're out of the cattle business. You can always get more cattle. You can always go get more money. But if you run out of grass, you're done. Yeah, remember that. You should always have, and this is a quote of his, at the end of the winter, you should have one blade of grass left somewhere on your farm. Yep. He said some people hit the grass so much they throw a fire on it and burn it. He didn't understand that. But you've got to replant and be flexible. So watch what's happening behind you. If those plants aren't growing back, you need to either slow up your rotation, combine your herds, or maybe sell off some of the steers. And Ian says, there's 15% of your cow herd that should always be able to go to town. 15%. And those are the cows that have maybe a longer hoof. They're packing a winter hair coat. They didn't shed off correctly. Uh, maybe she tried to knock you down or whatever. There's, she's got a bad attitude. Those need to go to town. Manure piles, balling. Uh, if the cows are balling incessantly when you walk out to the paddock, they're just balling. They won't shut up. They're stirring around, walking back and forth. Those animals are not happy. And they're telling you so. That's a red flag. You should have moved them sooner. We talked about the rumen and the hair coat. If they don't have a slick hair coat, there's something going on. I don't like to see overgrazing. There was a lot of bare ground. Patch grazing is where you have a tall clump and then a short clump. A tall clump and then a short clump. That's where you gave animals too big of an area and they're selectively grazing. You shouldn't see that. And of course, trailing, you're gonna get trails. You can go back to that. Yeah, this is a picture you don't wanna see. I did that. Custom graze herd, that's the salt and pepper herd. And I made them reach under that wire because they got so hungry, I had them in there too tight, I didn't move them soon enough. Okay, so the cows got down on their knees and reached under that wire. Don't. It looks like you took a lawnmower and mowed it on the other side of the wire. And when I moved them, of course, I put the back fence back in. Okay, go ahead. That's tip grazing. So that's a uh, fall. That's a fall picture. That's a that's a heifer. She's getting ready to go in the winter. She's had her first calf, and we call this wintering the calf on the fat of the tail. So when you got a lot of fat on that tail head. That cow is giving that calf just a little bit of milk all winter long. Okay. Gerald Fry got me into this years ago, and I thought he was nuts. I'm like, if I leave that calf on that cow in the winter, she's going to look like a starvation diet by the time I get to winter. 
time I get through spring. And he goes, well, some of them will. The ones that have the high milking trait, they will. You don't want a beef cow that gives a lot of milk. In the United States, we've bred that in EPDs, high milk, high milk, high milk, and now we've got these great big old calves, great big old cows that are bankrupting us. The number one profit killer in the United States right now, besides open cows, are big cows. Yep. I talked to the cell barn owner. I said, what did you do? He just wrote an article. said, we, boys, we've got to get them bigger. I had steam coming out of my ears. And I can talk to this guy because he's one of my custom grazers. That's who we custom graze for. I said, Justin, what are you doing? How big do we got to get them? He goes, the size of an elephant would be perfect. <laughs> well, guess what's happened? That was about 10 years ago. Justin was selling 147,000 yearlings a year. He had two sale barns. Now he's down to one. Last year he sold 72,000. What happened to all those cattle? Those producers were not making any money. They sold out. That land has now got row crop, GMO, soy, and corn on it. They ripped the fences out. They are filled in the dugouts, rented it out, cash rented it. Yep. So Justin told me at the end of our conversation, I told him what he was going to do. I said, you're going to put people out of business. And he said, Greg, you may be right, but I cannot change. Because I've told these producers for the last 25 years, we've got to get them bigger. And if I change now midstream, they're going to come after me and kill me. At least he was honest. Well, why, why do you want them bigger? The feedlots want them bigger. The packers want them bigger. When you've got people sitting there cutting up a carcass, if it's the size of an elephant, they're happy with that. And the bigger you get them, the more corn you can feed them. Do you realize that the, the, the feedlots are in the business of feeding corn in the United States? If you retain ownership, they, they like that leggy heifer that I showed. They love her because they can feed the heck out of her. What kind of rest periods are you aiming for with your tip grazing? Yeah, so the question is on rest periods, what are you aiming for? Um, it all depends on the rainfall. If you're getting rain, we call it the spring flush. A general rule of thumb is fast growth, fast moves. Slower growth, slow them up. Well, how are you going to slow them up? you got to combine your herds, make a smaller paddock. And so when people say, well, Greg, if I make a smaller paddock, they're absolutely going to overgraze that area, right? Okay, that's fine. It's better to overgraze a small section of your farm than the whole farm. And I did that. Folks, we got in a drought. It was in 19... That was before I went to Jim Garish's school in 91. I gave him the whole darn farm. I opened up every gate on the farm. My mentality was... Let's just give it all to them. They'll do better. Guess what they did? They went in and ate all the plants off because nothing had a chance to regrow. And I fed hay for eight months that winter. I'd have been better off to sold my cows than to try and winter them. Cost me a fortune. That was the worst winter in my entire life. I'll never do that again. I'm not going to grab that. I'm going to leave it over here. <laughs> yep, go. You're on. <laughs> This is a mistake that I made, folks, I'm leaving them an extra day, because this is what happens. You go out there, and you look at your paddock, and well, girls, you all didn't do a very good job. I'm going to leave you one more day. You could come out day two. Well, girls, you didn't touch this high spot over here in the paddock. You went back over and grazed this shorter. What did you do that for? The cattle will go after the most palatable plants in your farm, and they'll graze it down. They'll take that second bite. It's up to you to make sure they don't take a second bite. It's that second bite where they're, re they're removing the solar collector. You want to leave as much solar collector intact as possible and move them. It'll grow back quicker. We are in the solar energy collection business. Think about your farm. Is every blade of grass is a solar collector? Well, if your solar collectors are that tall, how much energy are you going to collect? None. Very little. But if you leave them up here like that, that plant's going to grow back quicker okay that's how you make money in the grazing business so if i left them another day they went back and regrazed the plants they grazed the first day my animal performance fell off of a cliff because all the energy has gone they're eating high protein plants and i look at them and i got a bunch of sheet cakes 
manure pats, little thin manure pats. They're not doing very well. Neither are the calves. I like that picture. That's one of those paddocks that got away from us in the spring. I let it go. I came back around and those cattle, they ate about a third of it. They trampled a third on the ground and they left about a third standing. Folks, that paddock right there was our best winter feed because that was done in July. It had all the rest of the year to grow and come back and I fed it. I fed it all that carbon. And the earthworms came in and ate all that and boom, all this stuff grew up beautiful, beautiful green forage. No chemical fertilizer. Ian looks at it this way. If you're using a lot of ammonium nitrate or you're putting a lot of nitrogen on your farm, he calls that a drug addict. You got to go get my fix. Stick me, give me my fix. And they love it because they've killed your soil. They know it. They're going to be back the next year to get your chemical fix. You got to push that. You got to push that away. Start trusting your grass. Start trusting your cattle. Start using management. You don't need all that chemical fertilizer. You just don't. That's the drought of 2012. We sold off a third of our herd by July. Received the top price. Everybody else in the Midwest did not. They kept praying for a rain, and I do. I pray for a rain too, but it's not a good management strategy. You've got to manage for what you know. You know it hadn't rained. You know the plants aren't growing back. You know how many animals you have. Sell some of them. Number one, sell some of them. Every day that you drag your feet and don't do that in a drought, you're going to end up selling some of your cows that you didn't want to sell because a good cow will eat just as much forage as a bad cow. And you waited too long. And you wait too long, now everybody's bringing their cows, and that's what happened in 2012. Jan and I received top price. The rest of the farmers brought their cows in the end of July, August. You know what they were told to do with those cows? Take them home. They didn't even have a market for them. They were so thin, they didn't have a place in the cell barn to unload them. They were just jam-packed full. Take them home. Now, here's an old farmer, maybe not old, young farmer, whatever. They didn't have any hay to feed them. They'd already went through all their hay, and their pastures were this tall. Folks, that's a lack of planning, and that's on you. I get it. I, you know, I know there's a place maybe for subsidies for the government to help people, but I hate it because it makes them weak. It makes them weak. They don't think anymore. That's what happened in 2012. All the, all the thought, they were beating down the government door for Please give us our money, give us our money. And they came to me and said, you need to go in there and get a check. I'm like, I'm not going in there. That was the most profitable year we ever had. It's called management. It's not dependent on the government to bail you out. Got to have recovery, folks. Combine those herds, maybe destock. Water uptake. Water's a big one. You got to have deep gulps. And if they don't take a deep gulp when they bring their head up, they're licking. They're licking at the water around that tank. They're telling you it's got bacteria in it. Cows are 70 to 75% water. And if you're not getting enough water through them, they're not going to gain weight. They're not going to eat as, enough forage. So that's our treatment, this little deal here in the middle. You'll see a, a cutaway picture of that in a minute. I saw that fly on and I'm, like, I'm thinking dung beetle. <laughs> it's not. What do you put in there to treat those? I'll show you in a minute. I've got a picture of it. It's called hypochlorite. Yep. Just brown. Yep. Are you letting the animals in the dugout to drink? Oh, nope. We, use a, we have a water buggy or we pump out or whatever. We never let them in. Yeah. That's a good one. If you're not letting the animals in the dugout, that's a good first step. Uh, one thing you do have to be uh, realized on a dugout is the watershed. If you've got shade up here in front of your watershed and there's a group of trees around it and those cows go into that watershed and they get out of the sun, and they poop there for two or three days, and you get a rain, boy, you've washed a lot of nitrate, a lot of, a lot of nitrogen into your pond. And then you'll get an algae bloom. It might even turn brackish, and you're going to have problems. 
Yeah. Folks, this, I'm going to go back to that. That's a good question. Uh, glandular function. So this is, when you look down the top of a cow, I don't care what color she is. She'd have that dark, oily streak all the way down her back. This is maximum fly season. It was in August. It's typical to see three to 400 flies on one cow. This one had one, two, three, four, five, six. Why isn't she covered in flies? Number one, look at her hair coat. It's shiny. Number two, the dark, oily streak. If you put your hand up there and touch it, your hand's going to come back greasy. It's got oil on it. Flies don't like landing on oily animals because their feet, when that tail comes around to swat at them, they can't get their feet loose. On an old, dry, hairy cow that doesn't shed off, she's going to be covered in flies. I was in Washington, uh, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., big ranch, very wealthy guy, and he had a big herd of cows, and I'm out there looking at him like, get rid of that one. There was one cow in the middle of that herd. She must have had 10,000 flies on her, and the rest of the cows maybe had 100. I said, get rid of her. And he goes, no, I can't. That's Petunia. <laughs> That's my daughter's cow. I said, well, then take her out there and put her up in that feedlot and give her a bale of hay. Don't let her infest your cow herd because that cow is breeding flies. And then those flies are attacking her, his good cow. They're called fly magnets. You can pick them out. Go out to your herd and the cow has all the flies. Get rid of those. All they're doing is costing you money. They're not going to give you any money back. Look for uh, oily, slick-hided hair coats on your animals. Okay, ma'am. Plant diversity. Um, we were on a farm, uh, well, the one at Dawson Creek, he had really good diversity in his pastures. There were seven to eight different legumes in there. He had all kinds of stuff in there. And somebody made the comment, I don't see any grasshoppers. Why is that? And I'm like, I can tell you why. He had a good amount of diversity. When you have a monoculture, you're attracting grasshoppers. When I go by a, past a soybean field, in the United States, I'm like, oh, man, look out. Here come the weevils. Here come the Japanese beetle. And now you've got a, a fly plane coming. We do, they do a lot of plane spraying now. They spray a lot of crops with planes. And uh, so when you see the monocrop, you're just inviting pests onto your farm. Well, why wasn't there any grasshoppers? First of all, diversity. Grasshoppers like a single monoculture. They also like bare ground. The farm before that, the one at Manning, this guy had plant spacing this far apart. That's how far apart his plants were. Those grasshoppers, there's millions of them, millions of them. They're eating him up. The grasshoppers were eating more grass than the cows were. But the guy down at Dawson Creek, no grasshoppers. Another thing about a grasshopper, they can't eat high bricks grass. The higher the sugar content in your forage, grasshoppers can't eat sugar. It kills them. How do you get high bricks grass? Feed the soil. Trampling, carbon, litter bank, that gets you a higher bricks. So prior to calving, the critical period is the last 60 days, 80% of your newborn calf is grown inside that cow. And so when you limit the cow, you're going to see it in the calf. When it's born, it's going to get pink eye, foot rot, you know, limping. Maybe you got a preemie. You got a calf that didn't grow out right. He's got a poor hair coat. You just tell he's not a good doer. Like, guys, darn it, where's the red? What did I do to cause this? You're looking out in your pasture. What did he eat or what did the cows eat? No, it was done 60 days ago. But you're looking for that red flag. It was already done. Okay, so don't limit those cows in that last 60 days. Okay. Free choice minerals, <clears throat> uh, we give them a cafeteria style. So there's 16 minerals in that box. <clears throat> Ian got me onto this in, 19, or in 2008. Uh, that's free choice enterprises. They're out of Wisconsin. There's eight mineral boxes on each side. The cows get to pick what they want. And if you go into a paddock and it doesn't have any phosphorus in the soil, 
In other words, the plant doesn't have any phosphorus. They can go over there and source it. There's also an alkaline and an acid neutralizer in there. So let's, let's just say their, their rumen goes alkaline. They can go in there in that box and they'll get a little bit of that acid. It brings the rumen back to seven. Folks, if a rumen never changes in the gut from seven, that cow will always breed. She's going to shed parasites. She's going to put on weight. And the calf is not going to get sick. So you don't blend your mineral, you just put it in separate? Yep. We are not that smart, you and I. You and I could line up on that and go down through there and take a lick out of each one. We'd kill ourselves. But a cow knows exactly which one they need. Yeah, I go up and do pasture clippings yep. and send them off, and then she makes my mineral for me. That's a good way of doing it. That's better than most people do. Most people just give them a complete lick. Here's the problem with giving them a complete mineral, folks. Let's just say they need magnesium. And they go into that, and they overeat on, I'm just going to throw a number out there. Let's say they overeat on iodine. And iodine limits the conversion of magnesium. So they'll overeat on the mineral trying to get what they need, and they don't get what they need. It ties it up. Okay? We're down to... Uh, are the calves smart enough? Yep. If you got calves open with them? Yep. Because I didn't find my calves that eat too much mineral. As the calves get older, they, they, they learn to pick that up. And a lot of times the calves are licking what the cows drop on the top of that tank. Yeah. Yep. Are you, are you just Four wheeler, yeah, it's on skids. It's got a, a big uh, log chain on the front of it. It's got a 45 cut on the four by fours. And we just drag it from paddock to paddock. Anywhere you have your water, folks, never put your mineral where your water's at. Always put, let's say, say this is my water tank in this corner. My mineral's gonna be over there in that far corner. Never put them together. Why is that? They're magnets. They draw cattle to them. So you got manure and urine. Don't put them in the same spot. You're bringing all that traffic to one area. Uh, we're down about 70% in mineral usage. Ian is down to three minerals now. He's been on it over 30 years. The cows have remineralized his farm. Exactly what's missing. We bring that mineral tub onto the Judy farm and we're rotating and the cattle won't even touch it. They won't touch it. They won't eat any mineral. But I go into a really newly leased farm that's poor, they'll eat me out of house and home. They'll clean it up. Yes, sir? Are uh, sheep uh, uh, the same way? Minerals? Yep. I hate to admit it. But I didn't give our sheep any mineral for 15 years. None. I just gave them white salt. I said, you all don't deserve it. <laughs> You're a sheep. You don't deserve mineral. And my thinking was that a sheep eats a lot of weeds and taller forage, brush, the brush is sourcing minerals deeper than the grasses were. And they're eating those leaves. So I didn't give them any mineral. And Mark Bader, the owner, he said, Greg, you need to give them free choice. I'm like, you just want to sell me more mineral. That's what I thought. And uh, so it went on. I never did change when Mark died three years ago. I'm like, you know, just, just to commemorate Mark, I'm going to start feeding my sheep free choice. But you've got to adapt it. I've got a video out there. You've got to adopt this. Bring that, bring that up because it'll kill baby lambs. They'll stick their head underneath there and one will jump up on top of that mat and it'll break the neck. So I've made an adjustment to, to do away with that. Guess what happened? <laughs> now I did two changes at once, so I can't blame it all on his mineral. But that was the first year we were averaging 1.4 lambs per ewe with no inputs, no grain, no hay, nothing. We went to 2.04. Last year we were at 1.86. This year we don't know what we're at until we get them up when I get home. But was it his mineral or was it because that was about the time we went to strip grazing our sheep, moving them every two days versus once a week. We were moving those sheep once a week. And now we're moving them every two days. And I'll cover that more in a little bit. So excess protein, it limits energy conversion. Heavy legumes, you're going to get a lot of protein. You're going to get some runny stools, and they'll actually lose weight. When you get a lot of protein in an animal, it actually forms an ammonia gas, and it goes into the lungs, it clogs up their lungs, and they can't get the oxygen. That's right from Mark Bader. Oh, gosh, I love that. That is one beautiful manure pack. It is. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, you could take that and put it in a bowl and put a little milk in it, sugar and a banana, it'd be good to go. <laughs> yeah. It'd probably help your rumen function too in your gut. <laughs> Might get some of those microbes working in there. Yeah, so the consistency, the height of it, you don't want a big stacked up manure path. That's telling you you've got, those animals are not getting any energy. It's too cellulosic. They're, they're having to work too hard to break that down. There we are grazing the tips in the fall. Tree swallows. This is something I was on a farm and a guy had 200 tree swallow houses up and there wasn't any flies on the cows. And I'm like, well, what's the deal with the flies? Well, he said, uh, I said, you don't even have a horse fly on your cows. Well, he said, the horse flies have learned to stay in the woods. He called those B-52 bombers, the horse flies. These are F-16 fighter jets. <laughs> and a uh, horse fly is no match for a tree swallow. And so an adult pair of tree swallows will eat 8,000 flies a day. Folks, you've got them in Canada. I've already talked to a gal put up some. And she said, I never saw one until I saw your video. And I put up a house, and the next day there was one in it. So she put up another one the next day. <laughs> And she's now got two pairs, and she's, so she's going to build some more. You've got to put them out in the middle of the field. Put them in a fence line, get them away from barns, and they can't be any closer than 100 feet. Go to Tree Swallow Blog, Google it. It'll tell you how to build the house, and it'll also give you the home range of these critters. I like natural fly control. Plus, they're a beautiful bird. I love seeing them. They're a little bit like a barn swallow. The barn swallows need a barn. These guys like living out in the field with your cattle. Okay. Uh, click two more times. One more. One more. There we go. So animal size, form follows function. The function of an animal is to perform in the environment to which it is born. Period. I ask Ian that question. What, what makes you call an animal from your herd? He says, as long as they can do that, he said, they're good to go. They got to give him a calf every year in the environment without any purchased inputs, okay, other than mineral. That's the South Pole bull that was sold down to Mexico. A guy has 3,000 head of cattle. They are great big cows, and now he's got them down to 1,100 pounds by using 1,200-pound bulls. So the cow on the, the bull on the left over there, that's out of that same herd that that lady was in South Carolina, had the real skinny cow. She's breeding her whole cow herd to that guy. She had a whole semen tank full of his semen. Oh, he has good EPDs. I'm like, really? That's a seven frame bull. You couldn't see over the top of his back. And he was on a whole pasture full of grass by himself and he was not breeding cows. That's the condition he stayed in. Now you want to breed to that? Not on a 100% grass. Now that bull on the left, if you'd have start pouring the, the grain to him, about 25 pounds a day, he would have fattened up. But when you put him into the cows, we call that bull melt. Has anybody experienced bull melt in here? Take a big old fat bull, turn him into cows, and in about a month, he just, poof. he loses weight and he leaves 20% of your cows not bred. So grass genetic females, they need a large gut, they need a feminine look, and they need a big butt. Why do they need a big butt? That's where you push the calf out. If you've got a little skinny butt on your cow, she's going to have problems calving. And I don't like a lot of hair on the udder, smaller teats. If you've got a big old long teat on a cow, she needs to go to town. Because what's going to happen, she's going to calve, you're going to be at the picture show or shopping some night, and you come in when you've got a calf that didn't suck. Because he couldn't get his mouth on that big teat. I don't like high-headed animals. I'm not going to tolerate it. Uh, we cannot tolerate it. We bring a lot of people onto the farm. We walk right through the cow herd. We may bring 300 people out there. Those cows cannot pay attention to those people. They need to be eating grass. Why are they, why are they running from you? Why? They're stupid. Yeah. I had one sick cow this year, and I brought in a heifer. She was like a high-headed, crazy heifer. Yep. Where do you find them? Your calves are sick around high headed cows. You what? Like, you get more sick calves from a high headed. Yep. Settle and the calves suck. Yep. <laughs> well, I was just talking to uh, Steve Kenyon's helper. They had one that actually, he's custom grazing for a guy. Well, it was you. 
uh, and um, they went out there and she would happened to be the one that had the high head and you know, they had a bottle calf. Yeah, you know. I just, I yep. Just, I hate that. Yep. Now, I understand a cow needs to be protective of her calf. I understand that. <laughs> you know, they should be concerned with it. <coughs> What's that? That's different than Yes. Yeah. Cow. Yeah. My yeah. headed cow's just stupid. Uh, they don't have any brains. They need to be ground into hamburger. But one that tries to kill you. Some people want a cow that's aggressive. When you get around the cow, well, she'll fight off a wolf or she'll fight off a bear or whatever. That's fine if you fetch your mentality, but don't let your kids go out there and tag that cow's calves. They're going to get hurt. I had a, you know, there's more, there's more people killed in the United States with cows than there are uh, school shootings. Yep, there's more people killed every year with cows than there are school shootings in the United States. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Why? They kept the dang thing. She had a good calf. Jan and I used to custom graze cows like that. These cows were nasty. And I asked us, why do you got cows like that? Well, she gives a good calf. Yeah, but she tried to kill us. <laughs> Doesn't matter. She gives you a good calf. All right. And the males need to be masculine looking with a large gut and a thick neck with that crest on the neck. That's masculinity. Okay? Don't like hair on the testicles. I hate that. They should be buckskin and no lopsided testicles. You don't want one up here and one down here. They should be even. Get the right frame size for your environment. Folks, I don't know what your size is here around Edmonton. But I found out down at Dawson Creek, I always thought, you know, you're up here in Canada, maybe your ideal size is 1,400-pound cow. I don't know. But I know in central Missouri on my farm, that ideal size is 1,000 pounds. And if I go up to 11 or 1,200, that cow is going to get thin on me in the wintertime. She can't take her calf through the winter. She can't. By March 1st, you can go through them and pick them out. There's one, there's one, and there's one. Oh, by the way, those are the biggest in the herd, sure enough. So the bigger the animal, the more feed they take, it's harder for them to take that calf through the winter. The guy at Dawson Creek is now down to 1,200 pounds, 11 to 1,200 pounds. He started out with 1,500-pound cows. He said, I'm never going to go back to those big cows. He's weaning a higher percentage of his body weight, those calves are. And I said, but you don't calve until May. He said, yeah, this year I'm kind of Pithing toward the middle of May to the middle of June. I'm like, isn't that kind of late for Canada? He goes, yeah. But I don't have to have him froze anymore. A frozen calf has a poor weaning weight. Aren't they a little bit light going into the fall? Yep. That's why I winter them on the cows. He's doing it. He's leaving those cows with that calf until the 1st of March. Exactly what we're doing. He said, the good ones can do it and the bad ones can't. So you are the predator in your herd. You are the predator in your herd. If you take that calf off, let's just say you had a calf born today, June 20, whatever today is. That calf isn't going to be very big by fall. You take him off, he's not going to do well. But if you leave him on the cow and let that cow take that calf through the winter, I don't know. That's why you had y'all. That's why y'all had me come up here. Just give you some ideas. I'm not telling you to do it, but something to think about. Yep, he's finishing in that period too. He's all grass fed. This guy's all grass fed. And I ate his steak. Everybody saw that grass fed is chewy. Folks, that darn steak was juicy. It was good. I ate two of them. I don't. I don't normally eat two steaks, but he cooked up enough. We all had two, and they were good. He didn't overcook them either. So all forage, no purchase energy supplements. This guy had a feedlot. It's all grown up in, in weeds now. He's going to put his pigs in there. They don't go in a feedlot anymore. He's finishing them out on grass. I already talked about that. you got too much leg if you can do that. No wormy, no feet trimming, minimal leg, large gut, and no... A clean rear end, a sheep that has a dirty rear end is packing parasites. Get rid of that sheep. All she's doing is shedding parasites. And if she's a fish jumper, you shoot them. 
<laughs> you do, because if you don't, your whole flock's going to be going everywhere. I found that out. On day one, you'll have one. On day two, you'll have 25. And day eight, you'll have the whole flock going all over your farm. Now it's just a wreck. So we started with three wires, and we did that for a month, and there was one ram jumped out. I shot him. We ate him. Went down to two wires, did that for about a month. Sure enough, a ram jumped through that. I shot him. And ever since then, they've all stayed in because they know Greg's going to shoot the butt if they get out. <laughs> What's that? What happens if you don't? If you don't, they all, they'll all be getting out. It only takes one to train the whole flock. It only takes one. He's a troublemaker. Shoot him. Yep. Uh, you were talking about the finishing time on the, the grass-fed animals. What do you do with the, when you're marking them, you have to aim for that lamb with the customers that think that's too old? That think that what? The, the animals too old. are too old. They don't want them over two years or over seven months to lamb. Yeah, so we, you know, um, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, the question is, on a lamb, they don't want them over seven months old because once they get their, basically, it turns into a mutton when they get their teeth at 12 months. That's a mutton. It's not a lamb anymore. We have found with hair sheep, they're a whole lot better eating at 15 months than they are seven months. You have a lot bigger uh, lamb chop. You have more fat, more grass fat covering. And you go into butcher them. Folks, in the United States, it costs $95 to process a lamb. They don't go by weight. They go by head. Well, why would you want to bring in a seven-month-old 60-pound lamb or a 130-pound 15-month-old lamb? You're getting more dollars of meat for your processing. So we never butcher them young anymore. They're, I used to feel bad. If you're my lamb customer, sir, I'd hand you the lamb, and they'd go, well, where's the rest of it? You know, a 60-pound lamb, there's not much there. But a 130-pound lamb... You know, you're packing them up a chunk of meat. So that's the way we do it. <laughs> yeah, the hair sheep uh, don't have the lanolin content that a wool sheep does. And so you don't get that lanolin muttony flavor in your meat. I don't like mutton. I don't like greasy mutton. My dad used to raise that, and it was nasty. I, I, it, I'm like, oh, God, we're having mutton tonight. It was bad. Yes, sir? If you're keeping your lambs around for 12 months, are you having to castrate the ram lambs? Yes. Yes. So, we, well, let me, let me clarify that. Do we have to castrate the ram lambs? We did early on. We've got a ram farm now. So all the rams, when I get home, uh, July 7th, we'll go out and we're going to take out every ram lamb in there. They go to the ram farm with our older rams. How old are they at that stage? Uh, they are born May 1st. So May, June, uh, they're, eight, they're 10 weeks old. They're sexually mature at 10 weeks. They got a set of nuts on them like that. They can breed. You got to get them out of those shoes. They'll, they'll breed. And now you're lambing when? You don't want to do that. In December, January in Canada, that's going to be an absolute wreck. You have to control the males. If you don't, don't get into sheep. So, again, you're going to ask for some help? Yeah, anybody want to go pull ram after this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You raise your... Oh, pointing to him. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Uh, yeah, birth on spring green grass when it's warm. I count back five months. Now, Missouri, that's December 1st. The males go in, and they start lambing May 1st, and they're basically done in 14 to 20 days. Most of them you'll see done in 10 days. It's still amazing me. You go out there on Monday and you got four baby lambs, and on Friday you got 130. Those rams do not miss a trick. Because what happens is that you comes in heat, that first one comes into estrus, she sends a smell through your whole flock, and they all come in heat. Boom, like that. I wish cattle, you could do that. Got to move them. The sheep will have campsites down here. They go to the same spot every night, and that's where they poop. And that's where they lay down. And guess what? If you do that constantly, they're going to ingest parasites. The parasites are going to crawl up on them. Now you got worms. Keep them moving. Um, you need a large gut, very fine, dense bones. Stay away from a big bone. If you got a cow or a steer or a bull you're using, he's got a great big old bone on him. He's going to breed high maintenance animals. Leg bone, that's right. 
larger the surface, the more calories it's going to take to keep that animal warm or cool, either one. Pull the crutches out slowly. Ian talks about doing it slowly. If you're doing it twice a year worm, go to once a year. They got to be docile. The pigs, hot wire broke. We're rotating them out in the woods so the pigs do not get out in the pasture because they just destroy your pasture. <coughs> you keep them back in the timber, it's not a big deal. When you move them a lot, I don't like them to root up my farm. I like to move them. Um, long hairy coated animals, I'm going to get rid of those. The high milking ones are thin by March, get rid of those. The hair coat? Yes, the question on the hair coat? Here in Canada, like, my kids touched on showing cattle for a little while, we're commercial breeders, but we have some friends that are purebred breeders. Yep. And it's all about growing lots of hair. Yep. Washing your cow every day, putting fans <laughs> on it making it grow hair, so there's all this hair here. The first year we were in, we had this slicked out cow, and she won everything, and she was just like, we couldn't grow hair on her. And then, then they started trying to grow hair and grow hair. Like what, if you're saying hair is bad, then what's, what's the deal? Like the show animals are all hair. Yeah, so they do, they're doing the same thing in the United States. We got, only in the United States, we have refrigerator trucks. Yeah, you put them in there to make them grow hay, hair in the wintertime, or in the summertime. Yeah. I'm like, we're not raising sheep. Is it just, like, I don't get it. Well, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, yeah. so how, how do they're you breeding, know? They're breeding bulls that have long hair to cows that have long hair just so they have something to clip off. Mm. Folks, that's detrimental to the poor cow-calf guy. You need a cow that'll shed off in the summertime. I wish y'all could have seen that herd that I saw on Thursday. There wasn't a long hair on any of them darn things. It looked, it looked like you'd put armor all on them. I'm serious. They were that darn shiny. Who is this guy? This guy's name is um, Daniel Martin. Daniel Martin. He's a Mennonite. He's on the Alberta side of British Columbia. Only like five minutes. He's off by Spirit River? What's that? Spirit River. I don't know the name of that, that river. I think it is. Yeah, he's, he's on uh, the British Columbia side of that river. Yes. He's, you can see his place from the interstate or from the highway. Yeah. What he's done, folks, is he's gotten rid of those big animals, the ones that didn't shed off. He got rid of them. He gets cold up there, but those cows grow hair, but they get rid of it in the summertime. Yeah, I was just saying it's kind of funny. Here. It's stupid. I had a guy, he's a big show guy, he's my neighbor, he's got the refrigerant truck, and I had a bunch of calves, we were grazing, Jan and I grazed for the sale barn owner, we had like 400 calves out in this pasture, every one of them, it was June, it might have been July, they hadn't shed a darn thread out of it all, big old long hairy calves, I'm like, and I said, Jerry, I said, what, what's the deal with these calves now, they don't shed off, and he looked at the ground, and he said, well, he said, us, us show people might have something to do with that. We're breeding for hair. So, like, it's really hard to source, like, we're... You've got to find the right genetics. You've got to get yeah, the right bulls. Really hard, well, you can start with the bull. Yeah, start with yeah, the bull. That's, like, Go start. see Dan. Get one of his bulls. He doesn't even know what he's got. You know he's not even selling those. He's clamping them. I'm like, Dan, you've got a gold mine right here. You've got the right size. You've got the slick hide. I said, keep some of them bull calves. Folks, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to step on some stud producers here, and I don't care. I'm a stud producer, too. But I'm going to tell you straight up. Once you get the right bull, and he's giving you the right size cows, keep him, keep the bull calves out of him. That bull calf that pops out of that cow on your farm is already adapted to your farm. Why? He was fed your soil. He was fed your forage. He went through your environment. If you bring a bull from... I don't know, Montana up to here. You don't know if that bull's going to adapt. He probably won't. The further you bring a bull, the less chance you have of him adapting. But once you get one that's giving you the right size calves, slicking off, docile, keep him. Breed his daughters. Ugh. That's inbreeding. No, it's not. It's line breeding. <laughs> In, yeah, if it works. <laughs>
That's a good one. I haven't had a two-headed calf yet in 21 years. All I've seen is bigger gut. I've seen bigger guts and shorter legs. And my pocketbook has gotten fatter every year. You know why? Because people are beating our doors down now. We can't keep enough bulls in stock. We've got a waiting list at the house this long. People wanting to buy our bulls. And we get $4,300 and all we got in them is grass. No grain. They don't look like other people's bulls. They're a smaller frame this way, but they, they get this way. And you can walk up to them. They're not going to kill you. They're all hot wire broke, and they've never had any wormer, and they've never had any grain. If you can start offering those types of things to people, that's, that's, that's adding value. That's adding value. That's what that is. <laughs>